Hey guys, and welcome to the Ketogenic Nutritionist Podcast. I'm your host, Temple Stewart. I'm a registered dietitian, and I specialize in women's weight loss. I am super excited about today's guest. His name is Dr. Benjamin Bickman. He earned his PhD in bioenergetics and was a postdoctor fellow with the Duke National University of Singapore in metabolic disorders. Currently, his professional focus as a scientist and professor at BYU is to better understand the role of elevated insulin and nutrient metabolism in regulating obesity, diabetes, and dementia. Dr. Bickman is amazing. He wrote the book, Why We Got Sick, which was one of my favorite books in the health space of all time. It was really pivotal in me focusing and changing my career. It's a must read for anyone that's in the health space or just anyone that wants to get a better understanding of how their body works. Um, highly, highly recommend. He's also co-founder in a company called Get Health. They have the best meal replacement shake. I love it because it's combined with protein, but it also has healthy fats in it, which is not found in most meal replacement shakes. It's also got probiotics and digestive enzyme. My favorite personal flavor is the chocolate macadamia. And you get a special discount for any of my listeners. You can just use my name, T-E-M-P-L-E, Go to their website, gethealth, G-E-T-H-L-T-H dot com and give it a shot. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you guys to Dr. Benjamin Bickman. I know this conversation is going to be great. So thank you guys for listening. Hey guys, thanks for listening. I am super excited about this guest. I was thinking this morning, I have mentioned Dr. Bickman's work on every podcast that I have been on because it has just been super influential to me in my career as a dietitian. So thank you, Dr. Bickman, for not only just coming on my podcast, but being willing to kind of reshape the way we're looking at conventional medicine and uh, insulin resistance and metabolic health. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm delighted. Temple, you and I go way back. So this is a, a fun opportunity for me to chat with a buddy. Yeah, yeah. So I figured we should just start with kind of your, your bread and butter with what is insulin resistance? What is metabolic health? Kind of give us, give us the rundown on all that. Yeah, yeah. So those are, um, you asked two questions and they are not the exact same answer, but of course, very related. Um, insulin resistance is a problem that people are discussing more frequently, which thrills me um, as a, uh, that's one of my real professional goals. Uh, at the end of my career, I hope to look back and, and, and see that I've, that there is a bigger, that insulin resistance is something people speak about more often because it is the single most common health problem worldwide. And I say that as a guy who within the last three months, um, I've given talks about insulin resistance in five different countries. So this is not a local domestic problem, um, you know, insulin resistance and poor metabolic health. As much as, you know, within the United States, we have a tendency to think that the United States were the biggest, were the fattest, were the dumbest, were the most diabetic, and we're none of those things, actually. Um, we are not, we're not even in the top 20 of the most diabetic, yeah. uh, where these, these are problems that are global. Uh, yeah. Insulin resistance is global. So what is insulin resistance? It's a it's a problem with two parts, and they always come together. You cannot invoke one or discuss one without including the other um, in, in your general thought process and understanding why it's a problem. So yeah. insulin resistance is, on one hand, it is a problem of insulin, the hormone insulin working well. And when you look at all of the cells of the body, there is a spectrum where some cells are not working well. They're not responding well to insulin. Insulin's knocking on the door, but the cell isn't really answering. Yeah. That's, so the cell is resistant to insulin. That's the hallmark of this problem. On the other end of the spectrum are cells that are working perfectly fine. Insulin comes and knocks and the cell answers very readily. Yeah. That is a problem in light of the second issue with insulin resistance, which is the hyperinsulinemia. In other words, high blood insulin. And these are two problems that always come together. You cannot pull them apart. So anytime someone is describing insulin resistance, if, if it is happening, if this situation that they call insulin resistance is happening in the midst of normal insulin, it is not insulin resistance and the person is describing something else and using the wrong term. Now, to come back to that spectrum, though, just to help people understand why insulin resistance is such a problem, 
Remember, the second part of it is elevated blood insulin. That's fine for the cells that are truly insulin resistant yeah. because the high insulin is now taking what was a, a diminished response within the cell and in, in increasing it back to where insulin wants it to be, albeit with much more insulin pounding on the door. Sure. However, there were those cells that are as responsive to insulin as they ever were, and now they're responding too much. They can hear all the noise and they're responding to it. They, they still work. And that becomes a problem where there's too much activity in response to the elevated insulin. So that's insulin resistance. And then your comment about metabolic health, metabolic health can be defined, you know, that's one of those sort of vague terms. So there'd be any number of ways to define it. I typically define metabolic health in one of two ways. Um, which is either by invoking the metabolic syndrome, just because that's an easy, tidy way to define metabolic health. Do you have three of the five problems yeah. that involve elevated waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, elevated blood glucose, and then just generally we'll say dyslipidemia, high triglycerides, low HDL. Um, so that's metabolic syndrome, which is a tidy way. A less tidy way and slightly more um, maybe scientific is this metabolic flexibility or inflexibility where, you know, ideally you take someone who eats, eats some starches and they're, they go to glucose burning mode, yeah. have them fast for 12 hours and they're in fat burning mode. Um, but even this is a reflection of insulin insofar as mm -hmm. insulin dictates the fuels the body uses. If insulin's high, the body's glucose burning. If insulin's low, the body is fat burning. It really is no more complicated than that. In a person who's insulin resistant and they have elevated insulin, they're stuck in glucose burning. So even though they start fasting and they're fasted for 12 hours, they should have shifted to fat burning, but they're stuck in glucose burning. So whether it's metabolic inflexibility or whether it's the metabolic syndrome, which used to be called the insulin resistance syndrome, yeah. any way we want to define metabolic health, well, any way I could conceive of defining it it still comes back to insulin resistance. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And we live in such a food environment that people just never enter that fat burning state anymore. It's just very bizarre, but going back to the, going back to insulin resistance in itself, can you kind of just break down how that leads to weight gain and how that eventually leads to chronic disease? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a big question. So let's start with sort of the I, I typically, maybe because of how I teach my classes, um, I often will think of organ systems mm -hmm. and kind of go through the organ system. This is almost literally what I do, even though the class that I teach to the undergraduates is not called insulin resistance, why it, why you should care. I, I wish it were, but no one would care. Yeah. You know, like when I wrote my book, Why We Get Sick, I should have called it, what is insulin resistance? Yeah. Why does it matter? Whatever. But I knew no one would read it. Right. Because people don't know what insulin resistance mm -hmm. is. And so in the class I teach, it's pathophysiology. So yeah. it's the disease state of all the systems, all the organs. And I just find ways to sort of mention insulin resistance from time to time. Yeah. Um, so with, with regards to diseases that are derivative from insulin resistance, you really, you literally can go from top to bottom, mm -hmm. from outside to inside, whether it's from the skin and the acanthosis nigricans because of the hyperinsulinemia overstimulating melanocytes to produce more melanin, or whether it is the insulin resistance of the brain, of course, driving Alzheimer's disease, or insulin resistance um, affecting the liver, increasing fat production, causing fatty liver disease. Yep. But, but then maybe... Um, Two that I'll mention because there's such an interesting um, dichotomy is the infertility um, the, of metabol of metabolic problems, yeah. and that's erectile dysfunction in men, or of course PCOS in women. And that's something I know you've spoken about yeah. um, quite often. So each of those is, of course, the most common infertility in, in men and women, respectively, mm -hmm. and yet they're they're perfect examples of the two sides of what we call insulin resistance. Yeah. the compromised insulin signaling contrasted with the elevated insulin. Because in the case of erectile dysfunction, in normal erectile function in the man, part of the erection is a consequence of the, of course, rapid vasodilation, yeah. increasing blood flow. Insulin yeah. plays a part of that. Insulin yeah. actually facilitates that vasodilation yeah. by 
telling the blood vessels to make more nitric oxide. Yep. But when the blood vessels become insulin resistant, even though insulin's trying to tell them to make more nitric oxide to facilitate vasodilation, it no longer happens yep. and the vessels stay constricted and now the man has erectile dysfunction. Yeah. So that is a consequence of the insulin resistance part of it. In contrast, a woman with PCOS, that's not the insulin resistance part of this per se, but rather the high insulin. In her body, the cells of the ovary are still sensitive to insulin. They're not insulin resistant, even though the body is insulin resistant, those cells aren't, but now they are hyperactive or hyper responsive to the high insulin levels. And insulin tends to naturally inhibit the conversion of testosterone into estrogens. You know, it's a little known fact that all estrogens were once testosterone yeah. and insulin inhibits that conversion. And so now if there's too much insulin, there's not enough conversion, which means not enough estrogens. And now her cycle is disrupted. So again, from top to bottom, from outside to inside, we can go through the, you know, brain cells to bone cells, lung cells to liver cells. Insulin resistance will impact every cell of the body because every cell of the body has insulin receptors and some response to insulin. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest things that was so shocking to me when I read your book, I read your book as a first year, I was a, a new, new dietitian. And I remember being so surprised at all the conditions that really have root cause and insulin resistance, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, dyslipidemia, PCOS. I mean, you can go on and on and on and you can find a lot of these root causes, but it seems like one of the biggest travesties is we're not really treating it. We're really mm -hmm. kind of throwing a lot of band-aids at it. And so I remember being really surprised um, by that. So I think that was a really wonderful definition. Can you think of anything else that a, a lot of people just don't really realize is connected to, to insulin resistance mm -hmm. that's surprising? Yeah. Typically the most surprising is actually the skin. Yeah. Um, that's why I, I often will lead with that. Like the talks I gave, I just gave, um, some talks in Korea and Japan just a couple weeks ago yeah. and my little boy came with me oh. and he, well, we loved it. He wanted yeah. to go to the Nintendo store in Tokyo <laughs> and he was just over the moon. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. Mom and mommy and, and daughters were, were busy that week. So yeah. Yeah, anyway, anyway, so what I, I like to lead with that where I, I, when I give a talk about insulin resistance, I want to try to impress upon people, my students in whatever venue I'm in, um, to, to just understand how common these problems are. Yeah. And I will, one of these kind of leading questions will be uh, how, how it, giving insight into the fact that uh, the skin is sort of the window to the metabolic mm -hmm. soul. And it's, it's typically around the neck, but I mentioned one, which is called acanthosis nigricans, which yeah. is when the skin gets a little darker pigmented mm -hmm. and it gets a little kind of tissue papery texture, gets yeah. kind of crinkled and wrinkled. And that's important because of course, depending on the person's natural pigmentation, yeah. they might, you might not notice the darker skin, skin quite as readily, right. but you can still see the texture change and feel it. But at, similarly, while that's generally a change in melanocytes, mm -hmm. there are changes in keratinocytes and this kind of hyperplastic or this um, uh, spastic growth of, of skin layers. And then you get the skin tags um, along that, those same areas, typically, typically wherever there's a skin fold around the neck, yeah. if the person's a little heavier um, or the armpits mm -hmm. um, is more common as well, but a skin tag, I'm sure everyone already knows what I'm talking about. We've seen yeah. them, um, but it's not a mound of skin. It looks like a little mushroom, like yeah. a little stalk. And it's teeny, of course. But the nice thing about that is, so that is often the most shocking um, mm -hmm. to answer the question. Um, but people often look at those kinds of things and just sort of groan in despair, thinking that there's nothing they can do. Right. Those will go away. Yeah. They will be completely gone. The skin will return to its natural texture and pigment. The skin tags will just fade away and get re kind of reabsorbed, if you will, back into the layer of the skin. And within months, it can all be gone without any evidence that they were ever there. Yeah, totally. And you can almost spot insulin resistance a mile away with some of these things, even in lab work, you know, the high triglycerides, the high blood mm -hmm. pressure, all of this kind of stuff. It's like, even if they won't pull a fast insulin, and we could totally get into that too. But 
um, yeah, I, I, I think that the more people are aware of these like red flags, the more they, they know to go get some labs checked. And, and I think that's a good segue. So tell me a little bit, if, if people are hearing this and they're listening at home, what do you think is the best way to maybe go get themselves tested or checked? What do you think is, is the gold standard per se? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If a person has the opportunity to get a blood test and they can exert some pressure on the tests that will be done, do yeah. everything you can plead with your clinicians to measure insulin. Yeah. And ideally your fasting insulin is going to be less than six um, micro units per mil. Yeah. Those are our units here in the U S yeah. um, now, however, having said that, so that's the ideal. And then if the number goes up, let's say to around the low teens, that's not ideal. And of course it's higher teens in the twenties beyond. That's very, very problematic. Yeah. I say the not ideal part because like every hormone in the body, insulin has a rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. It will ebb and it will flow. And it's entirely possible that someone is exquisitely insulin sensitive, but they had their insulin measured and it came back at 13. That could be their absolute peak in the entire 24 hour cycle. And so I wouldn't want them to lose hope and think that they're, you know, metabolically ruined. Um, that's why it's nice. As much as I'm an advocate of measuring fasting insulin, it, it might not be perfect. And yeah. so a uh, couple that by looking at your lipids and you just mentioned them, yeah. um, look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. You mm -hmm. will always get your lipids measured. Even if you can't convince your clinician to measure fasting insulin, you will always get triglycerides and HDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You can throw the LDL number out the window. It is so irrelevant. <laughs> um, just take your triglycerides divided by your HDL. And there's some differences across ethnicities. You yeah. know, from, from, from blacks to Caucasians, to Asians, to Hispanics, yeah. um, it, it's sort of, or, or in South Asians, it sort of spreads out a little bit where uh, Caucasians and Asians, ideally that number is less than 1.5. If the okay. triglyceride to HDL ratio is less than 1.5, that's a good sign for blacks. Yeah. Um, that number is the cutoff is closer to one. You want that number to be okay. lower than one. And yeah. then for uh, Hispanics and South Asians, it seems that that number, the, the range is a little more normal around two. So if you're lower than two, that's generally a good sign. You know, 1.5 sort of splits the difference. Yeah. But so if you're less than 1.5, generally you're okay. But even to be a little better, if you're less than one, then you're, you're definitely good. Yeah. But that's just a further reflection of how insulin resistance affects so well, all of metabolism, you know, when it comes to lipids and, and fuel handling um, and, and fuel use, um, which tri triglycerides and HDL cholesterol is partly um, influenced by as they're transporting fats and other things through the body, but and they're both products of the liver. Um, but insulin just controls fuel metabolism, and yeah. the liver is at the nexus of all fuel metabolism, and triglycerides and HDL are products from the liver. And so yeah. it's no surprise that insulin wields such an influence over both of them. Yeah, no, I think that that was a, a, a great breakdown. And I really like that you mentioned looking kind of at the bigger picture. I think people get super hyper-focused on maybe a glucose number or specifically A1C is something that people really like to hyper-focus on and say, oh, no, Temple, my A1C is fine. Like, I'm not in trouble. Like, I don't, I have all these other red flags. You know, my blood pressure is high, but my A1C is this and mm -hmm. that. Um, and so I like that you mentioned, um, taking a bigger look and stepping back and, and take into consideration the lipid panel and all of that. Um, well, which, let me, which, let me just elaborate on glucose more, although I'm sure yeah. your audience has heard this before, but that is such a point worth, um, revisiting. Yeah. Un unfortunately, conventional clinical care has a glucose centric paradigm. Yeah. They are laser focused on glucose, including yep. the markers you just mentioned, fasting glucose, and we are obsessed with A1C. Yeah. By we, I mean conventional clinical yeah. care, not yeah. me and you. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that glucose-centric paradigm is so laser-focused, mm -hmm. so narrow, that it causes us to miss everything else around it, which, yeah. is, which is why we miss the mark. Because mm -hmm. insulin resistance is a state where insulin is elevated, but it's enough. It's working well enough to keep the glucose normal. So, yeah. so to your point, which you alluded to, and I'm just repeating in my own way, yeah. it, where people uh, looking at glucose can give a tremendously false sense of security, yeah. um, where they have these other problems, like you just mentioned, if they're a little overweight or have high blood pressure, even if they have high blood pressure, it's very likely that they have insulin resistance. That's yeah. such a common manifestation. So 
Yeah, so I want people to remember that. Insulin resistance is normal glucose, but it takes a lot more insulin to keep the glucose normal. So sure, sure, get your glucose measured. I'm not saying there's harm in that, but don't rely on that to determine the disease because this state, high insulin, normal glucose, can be present for up to 20 years before the glucose ever starts to change. So we want to use the more reliable indicators, focusing on insulin, and, and the blood lipids, which are a consequence of the insulin resistance, much sooner than the glucose change is going to be. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think there is a lot of people, or there are a lot of people that use that as a safety net. And I, I see it all the time when I pull, when I get those fasting insulin labs pulled and they have a low, our normal A1C, and you come back with a relatively high fasting insulin and they're like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. But that could be a, a diabetes case that we've just prevented. Like you mentioned, it's 20 years ish behind, which is pretty scary. And also makes me question why we're not doing this on every routine yearly physical, um, on everyone. I don't I understand. Um, it's, well, I, it's, I, it's primarily, I know, I, I think it's just primarily a lack of knowledge. Yeah. Um, yeah. we only know what we've been taught and this right. goes across all professions, including physicians yeah. and just clinicians generally. Yeah. Because we have a glucose-centric paradigm, that's the way that all clinicians have learned it. Yeah. And so the idea of measuring insulin is just a foreign idea. But thankfully, the tide is turning. Yeah. More and more clinicians, perhaps because more and more patients are requesting it, are waking up to this reality and this broader view that encompasses superior markers of metabolic health. Yeah, I like it. And I'm going to chase a rabbit with this question, but since we talked, started talking about lipids, I'm just curious when you're looking or thinking of your lipid panel or a lipid panel, are you more concerned when you're thinking about metabolic health with insulin sensitivity? Or are you concerned with cholesterol, LDL? I know you kind of hinted to this and I'm sure we have pretty much the same views, but I would like you to just share kind of your knowledge mm-hmm. on this. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I'm happy to. So I, I would refer people to an article that I published with David Diamond and Paul Mason yeah. Yeah. Both wonderful scientists and, and physicians in the case of Paul. Um, we published a paper looking at the utility of blood lipids and predicting heart disease and um, predicting who would have the most benefit from statin use, one of the most overprescribed drugs on the planet. Yep. Um, so in general, um, we have an LDL obsession where that is the end all be all of all markers in in heart disease risk. And the reality is LDL is a terrible predictor. It it essentially has uh, no predictive power at all. A massive study done out of UCLA medical school hospital system. They, they monitored, they, they, they rather tracked everyone coming in with a heart attack. They plotted where their LDL levels were. And it was a total bell curve, and the most common number, the peak of the bell curve distribution, was was normal. Um, and they found that more people had come with a heart attack who had LDL levels that were I, good, ideal, than had problematic LDL numbers. So LDL had no predictive power whatsoever, and thus it's no surprise that using LDL as the indicator to um, prescribe statins doesn't really help either. Yeah. Um, but what we found... In, in the paper we published was that um, not that, that this is not to say LDL doesn't matter. I should be careful, but our, our kind of overly simplified understanding of it, yeah. looking at it as like this monolithic thing that has no variety to it is problematic. So LDL itself comes on a spectrum. Um, and, and this could be why it matters. And it could explain some of the conflicting evidence where some people say LDL matters. Others say it doesn't. It may be because LDL has such a variety to it, specifically its size and density. Yeah. Um, and the smaller, more dense LDL appears to be more atherogenic than the yeah. larger, more buoyant LDL molecules, which appears to have, uh, again, no problem with regards to heart disease. But yeah. most people don't measure their LDL diameter and density. Yeah. But that's where, once again, the triglyceride to HDL ratio is, in fact, a surrogate marker, not only of insulin resistance, but also LDL density. That if someone has a higher triglyceride to HDL ratio, that heavily, heavily correlates with a more smaller, dense um, LDL, which is more atherogenic. And it's no surprise, knowing that, that it should be the triglyceride to HDL ratio that is used as the um, determinant for prescribing someone statins. What we found 
was that if someone had a higher triglyceride to HDL ratio, there did appear to be a mortality benefit and a lower risk of heart disease. Now, yeah. I say that very, very cautiously because yeah. rather than someone taking a statin, I would much prefer that they improve their triglyceride to yeah. HDL ratio by, and thus their, their LDL diameter by changing their diet, which, which yeah. can be very, very readily done within weeks. Oh, yeah someone can take a very dense LDL phenotype within their body and expand it into the very mild, benign, and even healthy, um, larger LDL. But just to defend LDL, especially in women, yeah. um, uh, the lower the LDL gets, the higher and higher the risk of Alzheimer's disease, the higher the yep. risk of blood-based cancers like leukemias, and the higher the risk of serious infections. And it's yep. not subtle either. It's like a 15 times greater risk as LDL goes lower and lower. LDL is protective um, of the body. It is essential. Yeah. And by waging war on it, it's no surprise that there really are disastrous consequences. So um, blood lipids matter, but not the way most people think. In general, like my, my, my kind of concluding thought on this is if someone sees that they have a high LDL, but they have a very low triglyceride to HDL ratio, I typically want to give them a high five and yeah. say, you're probably going to live a longer, healthier <laughs> life than your counterpart. Yeah, I completely agree. It's very interesting to see the things people hyper-focus on. It's like, I'll have clients that come back to me, Temple, my doctor put me on a statin. And it's like, well, what do they say to you? Well, they hyper-focused on my LDLs. Like, did they mention your CRP? That was 4.5 or seven. Did they talk about your fasting insulin? That was 17. Oh no, they didn't, they didn't mention that. They just focused on the LDL and it's like, Oh goodness. Like we're, you know, I, so it's just that lack of, um, ability to put everything together. And, and I didn't, we haven't even talked about inflammation yet, which I think we could go yeah. there as well. But yeah, I, I, I appreciate your thoughts on lipids. Cause I, I wholeheartedly agree that they're important. And I think this fear of fat is absurd in a lot of ways. And a lot of times when people fear fat, they just turn to eating more grains and trash mm -hmm. foods and it just mm -hmm. ends up being the sugar fest. So um, anyway, I think I like your point there, but could you talk about CRP? Could you talk about the way that oh, yeah. insulin and insulin kind of play together? Oh, I'd be happy to. Yeah. So one parting thought though, on that previous um, discussion is that my view on why we hyper-focus on one thing versus another, why hyper-focus on glucose and LDL and yeah. not insulin and triglycerides it's because those are very druggable targets. We have drugs that will specifically lower glucose, like yep. injecting more insulin. Yep. We have drugs that will specifically lower LDL, like statins. Yep. And so there, I think we need to be very, um, very open to the fact that, although this sounds a little cynical, but that, that does drive the way people practice medicine, 100%. unfortunately. It's yeah. what, is there a drug that we can give someone um, to help them reinforce the idea that that is the marker that matters. Yeah. Science, science be damned. You know, we just have a good mm -hmm. drug here. So that's very much a part of why I think those have become targets at the expense of better targets. Now, yeah. um, inflammation, just by way of, of background um, in answering this question, this is the singular reason why I got on the path I'm on to this day. When I was a young master's student, wondering what I was going to do. You know, I was a newly married man, um, yeah. you know, just to get a little personal, newly married um, and, and fully anticipating um, being the primary breadwinner for the family yeah. and being a husband, of course, already a husband, but being a future father someday. As a young man in my mid twenties, that weight, that burden settled on my shoulders. It was a very big deal uh, yeah. where I was looking at my future career and and really taking seriously this this responsibility of being the provider and protector and yeah. and, allow, and my wife wanting to really be the her role as the kind of nurturer and nourisher you know nurture and nourish yeah. provide and protect these two opposites because yeah. men and women are very different of course very um despite what people may say these days <laughs> we could do a so, whole other podcast yes <laughs> yeah yeah don't get, don't get me started i know right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when I was on that, when I was faced with this future, but knowing I wanted to be a professor, I wanted to be a scientist, even though I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it yet. Um, I stumbled across one paper 
published out of a lab. And I, I, I remember the moment clearly. I, I, I don't want to invoke the power, divine power here, but yeah. I, I really felt like this, it was a pivotal moment for me. And, and I felt it in my yeah. soul that this yeah. mattered. And it was something I'd been really thinking about. And yeah. I'll say here, even praying a great deal about yeah. for some kind of yeah. guidance. And this manuscript I found put me on this path and I'm forever grateful for it. But yeah. the manuscript, to get to my point, basically outlined the connection or, or presented this theory um, connecting obesity to insulin resistance or, or to diabetes. That's yeah. the connection they made. So the connection was trying to better understand, and this was in the late 90s, trying to better understand um, what is the connection between well, that's when the paper was published. I found it in like 2001 or something. Yeah. What is the connection between obesity, namely fat cells specifically, and diabetes? And the connection that was put in place was insulin resistance. That insulin resistance was the connection between fat yeah. gain or f too much fat and diabetes. But, you know, and I'm, in my mind, I wanted to envision the pathway. What led to what, which led to what, which led to what? And it basically, the paradigm that they presented was so beautiful and made so much sense to me and has since very much been um, uh, supported and, and yeah. collaborated. It was that fat cells get big. They produce inflammatory cytokines yep. like C-reactive protein. Yep. Um, and then the inflammation drives insulin resistance and the insulin resistance drives the type 2 diabetes. So then let's just by way of answering the question more explicitly, let's kind of go right back to the beginning of it, where if people have too much fat, at the time that was described as subclinical inflammation. Mm -hmm. And if you ever hear something that is called subclinical, that means it has not reached the point of actually manifesting with overt sort of symptoms that would drive the person to the hospital. Yeah. Um, and so it's subclinical. It's there and it's aggravating but it's, it's a modest problem. Um, and so it was inflammation, not that has reached the point of a full-blown septic shock or a full-blown yeah. flu or whatever. It's not autoimmune levels of inflammation, but it's there yeah. and it's higher than it should be. So it suggests there's a problem. So it's almost like the body is fighting a mild infection that's not really there. Yeah. So it starts in the sort of swelling fat cell where mm -hmm. I, I'm sure your audience has heard this to, to varying degrees, but when we get fat, we can get fat through two different processes. We can either get fat through our fat cells multiplying. That's a process called hyperplasia. But mm -hmm. in that process, the fat cells typically stay quite small in size. In contrast, the way most people get fat, particularly men and particularly various ethnicities across like Asia and South Asia, especially and uh, less or so women and less or so Caucasians and blacks, that's a little yeah. more hyperplasia, which is why women can be fatter than men and be healthier. Yeah. Most people, even, even though with all this, most people, most of their fat happens through hypertrophy, mm -hmm. where the number of fat cells isn't changing as much. But again, women have a little more ex a proliferation than men do. But typically, as we're gaining fat in most people, it's through hypertrophy, where the the, the number of fat cells isn't changing much, but the size is. In this case, where the fat cells undergoing hypertrophy, it's, it's kind of difficult to really convey the degree of growth. The yeah. fat cell can grow more than any other cell in the body can. It yeah. can grow up to 10 to 20 times bigger than it used to be. And that yeah. creates a problem because it gets pushed further and further away from capillaries, from, yeah. from blood. And then it makes it harder and harder for the fat cell to get oxygen. Mm. And as it's getting hypoxic or, or suffocating, one of the tools it has to increase blood flow is to release pro-inflammatory proteins. Mm. In so doing, not only can it stimulate the growth of new blood vessels, but it will also act to increase the diameter, increasing blood flow. This is why if someone has an infection on their arm, it gets big and red and angry and hot. Yeah. because of all the inflammation increasing blood flow. So these suffocating fat cells are just belching out all of these pro-inflammatory proteins called cytokines. Yeah. C-reactive protein is one of them yeah. in an effort to try to increase its own blood flow. Unfortunately, the very steps that the big fat cell is taking to try to ensure its own survival 
are the very same that end up increasing inflammation through the rest of the body. Wow. And when other cells, like say the muscle, which is a cell type I studied quite a bit, and yeah. was, uh, was a paper that I published during my, my fellowship studies on this topic, inflammation to insulin resistance. So if I may be so bold as to say, I am quite an authority on this topic. Yeah, I like so it. So having literally done these experiments, when these pro-inflammatory proteins come to the muscle cell, they will directly cause insulin resistance. So yeah. inflammation is one of what I call to be one of the three primary causes of insulin resistance that you can remove yeah. any other noxious stimulus from the body. And if you just increase inflammation, that body will become insulin resistant. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's fascinating. And I love the, I've heard you talk about the hyperplasia, the way people get fatter on um, different podcasts. And I, I think that that's a kind of a misunderstood topic, but yeah, inflammation is one of those things that it's like, which one came first, the chicken or the egg? I never really understood with insulin resistance, but that's another lab that I like to encourage people to check mm -hmm. because it's often high in people that are struggling with losing weight. And you often see these really high CRPs and oftentimes people just aren't told about it or aren't told what to do about it. So that's interesting that fat cells really aren't benign. They don't just sit there. It sounds like they're very endocrine um, and active. Well said. Yep. Well said. In fact, when I began teaching the graduate class of endocrinology, I made sure to add a section about the endocrinology of the adipose tissue or the fat tissue. It is most textbooks don't even mention it, which is why I don't refer to the textbook, but you can yeah. take an entire textbook on endocrinology going through the prototypical endocrine organs, the thyroid gland, the gonads, the, the, the pancreas, et cetera. And it won't mention the endocrinology of the, of the fat tissue at all. Yes. Fat tissue is an aggressively active endocrine organ secreting all kinds of proteins and what we would call hormones into the blood all the time. Yeah. Very interesting. Sounds like you've got your work cut out for you then <laughs> more to study yeah. and more to learn. Um, it, cool. Well, tell me what you think. Where do you, let's, let's segue into like the treatment of obesity, the treatment of chronic disease. Where do you think things started to go wrong? Cause I think, again, we probably align really well on the whole calorie counting paradigm, but l let's go into that. What, where do you think we should shift our focus when it does come to treating obesity and, and chronic yeah. disease? Yeah. Yeah, things, um, the pr we are in the problem we are in, in part <clears throat> because of our view of obesity, which is purely uh, invoking the laws of thermodynamics, which I think was one of the greatest mistakes. Yeah. Thermodynamics, which I believe is a true and universal principle, um, especially with the, the understanding of energy and energy not being destroyed and energy in, energy out. That idea, yeah. I think, is all true and accurate, but yeah. it never should have been brought into biology. Yeah. I think that has led us down this rabbit hole of obsessing over things that we really can't measure. So part of my yeah. problem, well, let me preface this by saying energy matters. Calories matter. Of course they do. These are real molecules with real energy to them. They need to be accounted for. It's just impossible to account for them. Yeah. And thus, we shouldn't be focusing on them. So I, none of what I'm about to say means I don't want anyone to think that Ben thinks calories don't matter at all. They yeah. do. It's just pointless focusing on them yeah. because we can't fully understand the way the body handles energy. We cannot perfectly um, encompass all the ways the body uses energy. Yeah. Um, so, so that's why we need to, in, we need to, I think we'd be better served focusing on the endocrine origins of obesity, okay. specifically insulin, because insulin tells the body what to do with the energy that it has. Eating a thousand calories of ice cream will not have the same effect as eating a yeah. thousand calories of bacon and eggs. If you don't, David Ludwig at Harvard published very good papers, and he and I yeah. collaborated on another one that was sort of similar, but he found from his work that you could give people two isocaloric meals, exact same number of calories, and monitor their caloric expenditure over the day. And they found that if the meal had higher carbohydrates and spiked insulin, yeah. it, it slowed metabolic rate. And, and it was that would be a state where the body it would be easier to gain weight. In contrast, the meal that had very low carbohydrates, but the exact same number of calories did not slow metabolic rate. They had a higher metabolic rate. 
And the yeah. difference ended up being about 300 calories wow. difference. I mean, that's a pretty meaningful difference, especially if you extend it over months to weeks to um, weeks to months to years. Yeah. So the, the in, insulin is so determined <clears throat> to store energy in the body yep. that it will slow metabolic rate, making it easier to store the energy and it will prevent the production of ketones. Now, now why am I invoking ketones? It's simply because this is uh, one of the ways in which we cannot perfectly account for energy in the body. It's one thing to measure metabolic rate, you know, by, by measuring the gas and how much oxygen they're using and keeping this indirect calorimetry, but you cannot account for all the ketones that are being wasted. Yeah. So ketones are, ketones have a caloric value that is roughly similar to glucose. And yet we don't worry about the fact that if someone's in ketosis because of low insulin, not only does the low insulin allow the metabolic rate to be higher, which is one benefit, but at the yep. even, you know, David Ludwig found this, Kevin Hall at the NIH, as antagonistic as he is to ketogenic diets, he even published a paper that's, yeah. that found this. We published papers in rodents finding this, yeah. um, rodent work, very, very well done, very thorough. But yeah. also, not only, so again, not only when insulin's low, not only do you have a higher metabolic rate, but when you're making ketones and you're breathing them out or you are urinating them out, which you do. To various levels if you're in ketosis yeah those are that's energy that is that is literally c calories that are coming out of the body that can't be computed into some calculator for someone to try to estimate what yep. their metabolic rate is and what their caloric needs are so the dangers of our ongoing obsession yeah. of calories in calories out means that we are we are enthralled by this idea of eat less exercise more and <clears throat> That is a wonderful way to have some short-term fat loss, but it's also a very, very good way to get very, very hungry. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you might've heard me use this before, but just by way of kind of ending my spiel here, yeah. imagine everyone in the audience, imagine that, I, that we're all going to go out to eat and that we're going to this buffet where the world's best chefs are preparing the world's most delicious food. Yep. And, and Temple and I are hosting it and we say... Come as hungry as you can because you're going to want to try everything. Yeah. There's going to be so much variety. You want to try it all. So come hungry. And so what would you do to come as hungry as possible? Okay. You would eat a little less in the days before you went and you would probably exercise a little harder. And sure enough, you would indeed come to this beautiful buffet as hungry as possible. That's the problem. That is why eating less, exercising more can never really work in the long term because all it's doing is pitting you more and more against your hunger and hunger always wins. So put the caloric view of obesity on the shelf. I'm not yeah. saying it's irrelevant, but it yeah. will lead you down the wrong path. If you have a big weight loss journey ahead of you, yeah. you imagine that you can start the journey with one of two steps. If you start the step by cutting back energy, in other words, low calorie, but you don't address the high insulin, yeah. The high insulin in your body combined with the low energy coming in will result in the total amount of energy in your blood going down. David Ludwig published this paper. Yeah. And as the uh, total available energy in the blood goes down, the brain will sense that and it mm -hmm. will say, hey, we're running out of energy. Even though there's hundreds of thousands of calories stored in the fat cells, if you can't release that energy into the blood, the brain doesn't think it's there. And so yeah. the brain says, we need to eat. Yeah. So it's time to get hungry and eat. So if your weight loss journey starts with low energy without addressing your high insulin, you're, you're hosed. You'll, take, you'll get a little down the path and you'll give up and go right back where you started. So start your weight loss journey with low insulin yeah. where you don't have to be counting calories. You don't have to focus on being hungry. You yeah. eat as much as you want as long as you are controlling carbohydrates, prioritizing protein, not fearing fat, then you can lower your insulin naturally, which will allow the body to start mobilizing its own energy. And then the brain won't think you're hungry because there's more available energy in the blood for the body yeah. to use. And then eventually you may be losing weight and you'll get to a plateau. Yeah. Now you're, you're, you're adapted to using your own fat for fuel. You, you took that first low insulin step. Now you can take a lower energy step by incorporating the fourth point, which is frequently fasting. Now yeah. you start controlling energy, calories are coming down, 
but you're doing so in, a, in an environment where you're used to relying on your own fat for fuel. And so that's the order of things. Start with low insulin, then move to low energy and only have it be structured fasts. You're not going hungry. You're not keeping yeah. food on the plate. You're eating as yeah. much as you want. But when it's time to fast, you're fasting. And that's the way you are controlling energy. That second step. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with all of that. And, you know, as a dietitian, I was, that's what I was taught. I was taught energy in energy out calories in, calories out. And my first year I was like, this, this can't be right. This isn't working with anyone. Like it just was not working. I don't understand why I was taught this. Nobody's, they were all, they would lose a little bit of weight. Then they would gain back plus some so that the whole buffet scenario is exactly what happens. It's just not sustainable. And so when I switched my philosophy of teaching people that Weight loss is really kind of secondary to getting your hormones regulated. The game changed well and you know, everybody, yep. it's just so much easier when you can control hunger with ketones and low carb. And then also people just by nature, they tend to not eat protein. They tend to avoid fat when they're trying to eat lower calories. So it was just a hot mess. So I like the way that you described that because it is, um, your action steps were, were on point, um, there. So on the topic of just kind of the trends of the trends of weight loss nowadays, I would be amiss if I didn't ask you your thoughts on the 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 trendy topic of Ozempic and semiglutides. Uh, and yeah, can you break those down for us? Can you kind of give us an idea of how they work? Um, yeah, this is totally your 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 realm. So tell us how they work. Tell us why you think they're 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 trendy, and kind of give your give your two cents on it and your thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I have looked at this trend with um, wonder and and even some now increasingly morbid curiosity. I was um, just by way of background and and once again establishing some authority over the topic yeah. for the listener or or allowing the listener to have some confidence in what I'm about to say. <laughs> when I earned my PhD in North Carolina, the lab that I was in was one of the first labs that had the funding from Johnson and Johnson to study this new class of drugs. So yeah. before it was even in clinic being prescribed, we were doing research on these, on these drugs. So I have yeah. kind of had my finger on the pulse of these almost literally from the very beginning. Yeah. And I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I've never seen a drug class that was so quiet in such a small part of the market go from this to the, you know, expanding around the pie chart, yeah. consuming everything, even yeah. a drug that people brag about. So to your point, it, it is appropriate to talk about it because everyone's obsessed over it. Now, <laughs> um, my view on these drugs was that when they were originally prescribed as simply an anti-diabetic tool as a way mm -hmm. to lower glucose and thus improve insulin resistance, um, I was in favor of them. Well, generally, I'm never wildly in favor of any drugs, but but I could look at those and say, you know what, I give that a passing grade. I, I, those are all right um, because it was used at such a low dose. Yeah. Um, and, and nowadays, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, people found that, oh, you know what, even at that low dose, I'm kind of losing a little weight. And that, of course, led to it being now prescribed at multiples of that same dose. And I mean, like yeah. five to 10 times higher yeah. It is going way beyond where I considered it to be useful and, and perhaps, you know, a little more beneficial than risky. Yeah. My problem now is, well, myriad, and I'll kind of elaborate on them. So one of the, at first, I'll maybe I'll take a moment to defend its or to explain its benefits. Yeah. How can the drugs work? Well, the primary mechanism of action for these weight loss drugs is that they make you feel a little nauseous. Now, we say the, the the clever little spin we put on that is you have better craving control. You have yeah. better appetite control. But yeah. that's just the sort of pretty package to say you're going to feel a little sick to your stomach yeah. a lot. And that's, yeah. that will help you eat less. So that is the first most obvious thing is you start to feel a little sick to your stomach. And so you just don't eat as much. Well, you're going to lose weight. No question. But at yeah. the same time those drugs do increase, directly increase lipolysis or what we call commonly fat burning. Um, although it's more the fat breakdown part and the fat yeah. burning happens later. Um, but, but it will increase fat burning in the body. Yeah. That is a direct effect in the body of the drug. So that's a good combination. You, you, yeah. you're, you, you don't feel like you want to eat as much. Um, and two, you're, you're burning more fat. Now this next third thing I'll explain it as a benefit because when it comes to insulin resistance, technically it is, 
but that will be a good segue to explain the negative parts of it, which is another mechanism of action for these drugs is that they increase fat cell hyperplasia. Mm. Now, this is a bit of a paradox, but if we kind of hearken back or go back to the original description we had just minutes ago about how we get fat, and we have hyperplasia, which is the multiplication of fat cells, and we have hypertrophy, which is when yeah. the fat cells get really big and sick. In this case, what we're doing is expanding the number of fat cells, but, but it allows the bigger fat cells to share some of their fat with the smaller ones. Yeah. And so what we have is more total fat cells, but smaller fat cells. And so the actual amount of fat mass on the body goes down. So it is a bit of a paradox. So we have more yeah. fat cells, but they're all smaller than the way they than they were before, which means that they're all healthy and insulin sensitive and not promoting inflammation. Yeah. Which is a good thing. So that's that's sort of the a good and a bad because you have fat cells now that are more insulin sensitive, which allows mm -hmm. the body to be more insulin sensitive, less inflammation, which improves the type 2 diabetes. So all of these and maybe one last thing, I should have put it before this one. These class of drugs inhibit glucagon. And, and if glucagon, the hormone glucagon goes down, which is insulin's opposite, um, then less glucagon means less glucose coming out of the liver. So once again, a mechanism whereby blood glucose levels come down and it's an anti-diabetic medication. Now, let's come back to the fat cells. The problem with this overall situation is that eventually, and there was a study published that found it happened at around 24 months yeah. At around 24 months, the cravings start to come back. Yeah. In other words, the nausea that the person is feeling from the drug starts to go away a little bit. And what they thought was them having mastered their cravings was, in fact, really just a drug making you think you masked your cravings. Yeah. And unfortunately, the cravings start to come back at about two years Un and doubly unfortunate is that we now have a person who has more fat cells than they had before. Mm. They literally have a greater number of fat cells, potentially. Now, that's actually not in, in vivo human data about the fat cells. That's in vitro cell data. Yeah. But the evidence looks very strong. So yeah. the, the cravings return and they have more fat cells than they did before. And thus, as they start eating the way they used to, yeah. and as the drug's losing some efficacy, and they have more fat cells than they used to, it's no surprise that whereas their amount of fat was here before, now it's they've gone beyond it as they're gaining it back because they literally have a higher capacity to store fat while when the drugs, because the drugs were stimulating the growth of new fat cells. So this is, um, this is why my view on those drugs is complicated. Yeah. On one hand, I can acknowledge the metabolic benefits of it. Yeah. But, my, but on the other, I acknowledge the negatives that are waiting down the road. So eventually, yeah. whether the drug starts to lose efficacy or the person decides they're sick of feeling sick to their stomach, they're yeah. sick of feeling nauseous, or they're sick of paying 1500 bucks a month for these drugs, they may decide to get off them. Now they have the potential to have their potential to get fat is possibly greater than it has ever been. And that's, you know, that's a that's quite the dice that they're casting and rolling and just seeing what happens. So my view on these drugs, you use the lowest possible dose you feel like yeah. you can and absolutely couple it with a low carb diet. Now, David Ludwig, uh, who I mentioned already, a collaborator and friend at Harvard, he published a paper equating low carbohydrate diets to these class of drugs. These class of yeah. drugs are what's called GLP-1. Yep. That's a hormone. GLP-1 agonists. Well, a natural way to increase GLP-1 is through low-carb diets. Yeah. I actually kind of also have to insert a weird little plug here. <laughs> Another activator of GLP-1 is a sweetener called allulose. Yeah. Um, like yeah. There's a company, RX Sugar, that I'm an advisor for. So I, you know, maybe someone says I have a conflict here. But they are. that's also a natural. This is a natural, yeah. no-calorie sweetener, which also increases GLP-1. So if someone's on the drug already... Mm -hmm. Start to try to lower the dose with your doctor's permission, yeah. um, but use the lowest possible dose. And when you feel like you can get off it entirely, but yeah. just couple it with a low carb diet. Keep the keep insulin low. Keep the control your carbs. Focus on protein and fat. That's a natural way to increase GLP one. Yeah. And then maybe you're getting some of the benefit anyway without without any of the negatives. Yeah.
Yeah, I, I really like the way you put that. I agree. I think there's some advantages, but definitely some disadvantages, definitely some concerns with the way that these drugs are marketed as well. I think anything that blows up on social media is red flaggish. But um, I love yeah. that you mentioned the natural GLP-1 things too, like berberine, cinnamon, high protein. There's a lot of things that people can implement that are really helpful um, that don't well necessarily said. take you down that route. Um, cool. Thank you for that uh, perspective. So can you, uh, and I, I know we could probably go really long on this, but maybe quickly, because most of my audience are, are females. I have a lot of PCOS women, a lot of women in perimenopause, menopause. Could you just briefly kind of break down the female um, cycle, whether it's reproductive years and through menopause, and kind of just talk about some of the changes hormonally that go on, and maybe even some of the pitfalls that cause some of the the barriers to weight loss that come alongside that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So f the female, no surprise um, to you in the audience, ladies are complicated, yeah, uh, when, right. especially, <laughs> especially when it comes to um, fertility. Mm -hmm. I use the metaphor when I teach this in endocrinology that male fertility and male sex hormone regulation is like a barbershop quartet to yeah. the females orchestra. Yeah. You, know, you have a hundred piece orchestra, yeah. a symphony. It's just much more complicated. And that's yeah. no surprise it shouldn't be a surprise because it's the female that carries that kind of metabolic burden of, of fertility. Yeah. Yes. Men matter. Men matter tremendously. Yeah. Um, but, but other than an initial glorious event and then raising the child later, yeah. it's the female body that of course has to know, am I, is my body ready to commit to this? Yeah. And, and so it's no surprise that there's a lot of regulation here. So, I have a few a few thoughts that might be of interest. So during um, during the um, fertile years, there's just some interesting things about that dynamic ovulatory cycle. And the only thing I'll say about that is that during ovulation, if a gal ever notices that she um, is a little hungrier, that is progesterone. Progesterone yeah. has that is the hormone of pregnancy. That's basically the body's way of saying, "Hey, I'm going to be carrying a baby. Let's get ready to commit to this." So it's no surprise that during that time, she's a little hungrier yep. and she's a little more insulin resistant because yeah. pregnancy is a state of normal, natural, or what I call physiological insulin resistance. Yeah. The, her body will become insulin resistant for a reason, yeah. for multiple reasons, and it's healthy and it's supposed to happen. One of those reasons is to get a little fatter, yeah. to have that kind of metabolic insurance that if somehow food became scarce during the course of the pregnancy... Well, hopefully she has several hundreds of thousands of calories stored and she can rely on that a little bit to help f grow the baby, you know, to literally feed that baby, that, that fetus, and then hopefully be able to feed the baby as a newborn as well. Yeah. All of that's coming from mom's own energy. So it's natural that the, her body would want to get a little fatter yeah. and the insulin resistance helps that happen. So during the fertile years, the ovulatory cycle, no surprise during that progesterone peak during the right, you know, right around ovulation, yeah. she's going to be a little hungrier and a little more insulin resistant. Um, and that's natural, normal during when es progesterone comes down, everything resets. Yeah. Um, now during menopause, um, she loses the kind of protective powers of estrogens. Yeah. Estrogens are what makes the woman kind of a metabolic superhero compared to her male counterparts. Yeah. Estrogens are what allows her to be a little fatter than her male counterpart and yet be much, much healthier yeah. than her male counterpart. Estrogens help the body um, store and use fat in a way that is very healthy, even, even almost totally benign. But yeah. it is also why women burn more fat than men. Yeah. Um, most women sort of hear me say this and chuckle because they think, well, then why am I fatter than my male counterpart? Yeah. It's because they also, I mean, at the same time you're burning more fat in the female body, you're also putting more into the fat cells. Yeah. It's just a much higher kind of turnover. Yeah. And the estrogens help that happen. It's why her body is fat burns so well and why she stores fat in places that are healthy, like the butt and the hips. It's the estrogens that determine that fat storage. And those are good healthy sites to store fat. Yeah. As the, as she transitions into menopause, she basically loses that superpower. And now she, as she is, um, as affected by her fat storage as her male counterpart is, she's lost that protective effect of the estrogens primarily. Yeah. So that, that with that comes a potential shift in where she's storing fat. 
Yeah. Um, she may start to store less of it on her butt and hips and more of it on her core, yeah. which is the kind of prototypical male storage, because where we store fat is heavily influenced by sex hormones yeah. and, and a little bit of genetics mixed in there yeah. separately from sex, which is, yeah. of course, genetic as well. But there's a little bit of kind of familial patterning there, too. Yeah. So that's her transition as she goes into menopause. Now, as so it's generally kind of a negative story there. However, if I were to attempt to put any kind of positive spin on that, it would it would simply be to mention that during that same phase of life in men and women, that's when we typically start to lose some fat cells. So the fat cell number, which typically goes up during adolescent child, you know, infancy, childhood, adolescence, it's going yeah. up, 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 up. We're making a lot of fat cells. Then it plateaus for the next several decades yeah. until we get to our kind of 60s ish. So a gal's getting into menopause, maybe earlier than that, late 50, mid, late 50s. Yeah. But around that time, the number of fat cells we have starts to come down. That's an opportunity that I, I believe that if, if male and female, because again, at that point, she's basically, when it comes to metabolism, kind of like her male counterpart. Yeah. So in male and female, that's an opportunity to really tighten up your diet yeah. and take advantage of the fact that your body is starting to lose fat cells. So lean into it and help your body by burning that fat that is going to be coming from those dying fat cells. Yeah. Because the alternative is not good. Yeah. If you get into that phase of life in men and women where you're losing fat cell number, but you're coupling that with a diet that is elevating your insulin and providing enough energy yeah. to store more energy in those fat cells, yeah. then that means that the remaining fat cells get bigger and bigger and bigger even faster because there are fewer of them around. So it really becomes a choose your own adventure during that phase of life, menopause and male counterpart version, where you're losing fat cell number, you can either take the path of really committing to keeping insulin low yeah. to allow your body to be leaner than it ever was or as mm -hmm. lean as it ever was, or... Um, you may lose a little bit of fat mass, but all the fat cells are getting bigger. Yeah. And now you have more insulin resistance and the problems that come with it. So even in the midst of that problem, so-called, I think there's an opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I think those are some of the um, good, great action steps. And I think those are some of the, the hardest times for women because not only are they going through significant hormonal changes, but now they're dealing with weight gain around the abdomen. It's just a hard, it's frustrating. It's hard. There's mood swings, all the things that come with it. So I'm often finding myself, ha finding myself having to help women navigate that, but low carb and, and sometimes even getting into ketosis is very effective mm -hmm. for those stages. And so, um, I like that. I think that's a good segue to kind of go into some action items. And I know you talk a, a lot about this in your book, which I recommend everyone get again, it was pivotal for me and just shifting my whole thought process around this stuff, but talk about some of your uh, philosophies around nutrition and some of the things maybe you implement with your family. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my views, I already sort of touched on my, my central pillars, Yeah, um, which is control carbohydrates, focus on the least starchy carbohydrates, the ones with higher fiber, like yeah. vegetables and fruit. Yep. Focus on vegetables and fruit. Um, and be careful with everything else. Yeah. Prioritize protein, get high quality protein, particularly animal source protein. Agreed. Don't be afraid of the fat that comes with that protein. Yeah. So don't trim off stuff. Don't dump that yolk. Yeah. Eat the fat that comes with the protein. That's how we're supposed to eat it. We yeah. digest the protein better if it comes with fat. And then frequently fast. Now with those principles in mind, of course, you're familiar with this. I feel so strongly about it and wanting to make it easy that I actually developed a meal replacement shake that yeah. kind of meets all those rules. So anyone who wants to learn more, find out about the health code complete meal, go to get health, H L T H G E T H L T H dot com in temple. Yeah. I may, you'll put a link yeah, in the show notes. show notes. You can go there and that's a simple, easy way to yeah. just meet these goals or, you know, to check those boxes. But those are my kind of key dietary rules. No need to count calories. And then how I incorporate this as a dad in my family, because as much as I come on here to talk about the science, that's a small part of what I do. You know, most of my day is trying to be the best dad that I can be and a devoted husband. So with my kids, I, I've not, I've, I've never wanted to be too heavy handed with it yeah. because I've seen too many 
young women, particularly as a college professor who have eating disorders. Yeah. And it's, it's very scary for me. So I've never wanted to yeah. plant a seed in my children's minds of being overly obsessed with food. So in general, I, I, we focus on protein. Yeah. Even though I'm an enormous advocate of fat as well, it's weird to focus on fat. It's yeah. weird to ask my kids, have you had any fat today? That's a yeah. weird thing to ask. Yeah. So I will just say, hey, you want to eat some chips? Have you had some protein? Yep. You know, I don't want them to think of these things as forbidden. Although as the parent with my wife, we control the food that comes into our house. And yeah. so any parent who's looking at a kid who's who's getting a little chubbier than they want and they're getting to puberty age, when, which is when it really matters, before yeah. puberty, if a kid's chubby, don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, you, typically puberty will kind of resolve that issue. But if they're getting chubbier during puberty, you need to look at what habits you're instilling in that child Yeah. And, and the food you're bringing in because typically how a kid comes out of puberty is how they're going to be through adulthood. Yeah. You know, so late teens in a girl, early twenties in a boy, um, puberty finishes later in men. Um, that typically is going to be the body that our body's going to kind of reset to throughout our life. Not always, but it matters then. So parents intervene, look at yourself. Don't think you're not a part of this. So in my home, we try to not bring a lot of junk food into the home in the first place. Yeah. We just don't, never any soda, never any juice. It's milk or water. Um, sometimes they, we'll have goldfish crackers. Sometimes we have chips and, and that sort of just depends on kind of the mood in the home, but it's, yeah. it's even when it is there, we just try to have a culture of, have you had some protein yet? Uh, and the kids will know they'll go eat a little beef stick. They yeah. will have some cheese or they will have some, zero sugar yogurt or cottage cheese. My son loves cottage cheese and yeah. grapes. Yeah. Um, so th we try to just focus on protein because if, if it's a protein source, it's going to be one real food and two, it's going to have healthy fat with it as well. And then I don't mind if they want to go have some, some crackers later. Yeah. I'm good with that. Yeah. I, I'm fine with that. They're growing. I don't eat those crackers, but I'm fine with them eating them because yeah. they're still growing and that energy can be used to fuel the growth. But the conversation is always, have you had some protein? But also, I have the good fortune of having a schedule that allows me to do this. I will not, I typically stay home until breakfast is over. Yeah. I will make breakfast every morning. And it's even, it's, it has carbs in it. It'll be, it'll be crepes with lots of eggs. It'll be pancakes with lots of eggs yeah. or waffles with lots of eggs in it. Yeah. Even though I use flour, none of my kids have any gluten sensitivity. And even though they will put some Nutella on their crepe, I don't mind a bit. Yeah. I look at each crepe they're eating and think each crepe they're putting in their mouth has oh, one full egg in it. Yeah. And, I, and I'm thrilled for that. So I will make breakfast every morning. Part of it is because I like the idea of them getting just real food. But it's also kind of my own self-preservation because when we have cereal in the house, yeah. I am an addict. A, a true yeah. A true, my name is Benjamin Bickman and I am a serial addict. You know, now this you is know. my like confession. <laughs> yeah, that's my confession. If there is cereal in the yeah. home, as a result of my own habits, mostly from college, I yeah. think, I, I, I cannot control myself unless it's the most bland cereals. If it's Cheerios and Rice Krispies, which is generally the only thing we really buy. Yeah. And, we, and the kids will put honey on it. I'm fine with that. Those don't appeal to me. Yeah. But if it is shredded mini wheats, if it is Good honey job. nut Cheerios or whatever, <laughs> game over. It will be game over. Uh, <laughs> all all evening from the pantry, those cereals will be whispering yeah. my name. It's yeah. this kind of siren call yeah. tempting me to jump off the ship into the treacherous when you won't waters. Sleep, you'll feel terrible no. the next day. <laughs> yeah, but at Temple, it's so funny. It doesn't matter. Because we say moderation in all things, right? That's like the dietitian's mantra. I know. It's brutal. And yet tell that to an addict. I know it doesn't work. And so I will tell, I will go through this fiction in my brain. Yeah. I'll say, I'm just going to have a small bowl. It's yeah. fine. And yet there's a part of me like a true addict yeah. who will say, Ben, you know, you're lying. Yeah. You know, you won't stop because you never do. Yep. And so I find that one, it's better for me than ever to even start to quote St. Augustine, abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. It is. I cannot moderate. No. And it's better for me to never start 
But even better is to never even bring it into the home. Yeah. Because it's if it's in the home, it's like an alcoholic walking around a, a, a bottle of wine all night. And I will I will succumb to the temptation. I will overeat. <laughs> I will go to bed hyperglycemic yeah. and hot and bothered. Yeah. I will sleep miserably. And then the next day I'll say, why the heck did I do that? I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm yeah. so stupid. Yeah. And yet if it's there the next night, like a, like a dog coming, returning <laughs> to its vomit to, to, to you know, quote some testament, a new Testament, there you go. Um, I will come back to it and just revel in the misery and do it all over again. Yeah. It's I, two points you make one. I love that you mentioned a lot of times people think we like have this war on carbs. We totally do not. I, I got myself into trouble by naming my whole brand, the ketogenic nutritionist. So Everyone thinks I don't eat anything. I, I do. I just do it strategically. And my kids eat a ton of carbs. They just eat protein first. It's amazing how well you can regulate your hunger hormones when protein goes in first. And so yeah. I have the same philosophy with my kids. They do very well. We give them protein before we go to a birthday party and they'll have two bites of cake and then they're off running and playing again. So I love that you admit that. I also love that you admit your addiction to cold cereal because that's also a significant problem in my household. Yes. So we just leave it out. You know, um, it's a real issue. So what else? What other meal timing things? I know there was that study and I think I heard you talk about it first about fasting in the morning versus fasting in the evening. Now, I think this is a social issue. It's a little harder for my family because I will never uh, skip dinner with the kiddos. But is there some fasting strategies that you implement or that you would encourage someone that's really trying to get control of blood glucose and, and insulin and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely right. I like that you pointed it out. There's a timing to it all. It's easier to fast in the bre in, through breakfast. Most people just aren't as hungry yet. There are higher returns if you fast in the evening, but it's also very awkward. You know, I don't want to be the husband and father sitting around the dinner table and be looking at everyone while they're eating. Yeah. Um, it's weird. So um, my, my view on that is fast through breakfast. It's easier to do. Drink a cup of coffee or tea or whatever your habit is. And then just power through and eat a big lunch. Yeah. A hearty filling lunch. And when I do that, it makes it so much easier that when I come home, I eat a normal dinner and I'm still kind of full from lunch. Yeah. And then it makes it so much easier to plow through the evening. Yeah. So I try to have like a four hour window from when I've eaten before I go to bed. And yeah. so I try to, you know, if I can, um, and it's evening is when I'm at my weakest, especially if there's something in the home that's tempting me. Um, but I try to just not eat then, uh, eat, eat dinner and, and go through, uh, go through uh, the evening without eating anything else. And again, you would think, well, then just eat a really, really big dinner. Yeah. It doesn't work for me. Either. For some reason, I eat a dinner and I'm perfectly full, yeah. even over full. And yet I will still be tempted to start indulging even more yeah. than normal. Um, so I found that if I eat a big filling lunch with lots of protein and fat, then it makes it easier throughout the rest of the day. Um, so some other strategies for me, it's sparkling water. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and, and typically a little bit of apple cider vinegar. That's very, very often how I will get through a fast if I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. Yeah. I will also, depending on the time of day, um, if like if I want to do a 24 hour fast and I, I, I really never go longer than that, yeah. that's just not the way I like to do it. Yeah. Um, but typically every Monday from Sunday night to Monday dinner, I will fast. Sometimes uh, in addition to some apple cider vinegar, I will drink some yerba mate. Oh yeah. Um, I, I like that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so those are, some strategies that I've found generally works. Yeah, I, I agree. Sometimes I'll skip dinner if I'm like out with the kids at soccer practice or something. Yep. It just naturally happens, but I don't want to be the the odd man out sitting there at dinner either. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, tell us something you're excited about. Are you writing another book? What are you working on? Give us give us the scoop before we before we close up. Yeah, yeah. So I I am actually oh writing a new book um, just by way of you know, answering that question. Yeah. Um, so the, the first, why we get sick was such a fun book to write and it just sort of flowed out. And, and the publisher, Ben Bella publishing my publisher for the book really has been pleased with the book and they, they've really wanted to do a follow up. Yeah. And, and so they said, Ben, look, we'd like to make a book of all about implementing these ideas. Oh, you know, nice. the book really went through all the science of it. We really want to bring it down to just simplest steps. Yeah. And so the next book coming out and, and I had a co-author help because I said, I cannot put together exercise programs. I cannot put together meal plans. No. 
Um, but, so I will do the science and then someone else can help with yeah, the kind yeah. of where the rubber meets the road. And so um, my co-author is a, a gal named Diana Kulian, yeah. who's wonderful. So we have a follow-up book and it's called How Not to Get Sick. Oh, I love it. And it, it will come out early early next year. Oh, and, fun. And so that, that's what I've been working on now. In addition to maintaining the lab as usual, we have studies <laughs> exploring the degree to which ketones inhibit the inflammation of uric acid. Cool. We have studies looking at how diesel exhaust that's inhaled can signal to fat cells, to stimulating fat cell growth. So just more sort of testament to, you know, being mindful of the quality of the air you breathe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, kind of more of the usual lab work that's always pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this was a pleasure. Can you tell everyone how to find you? I know you mentioned Get Health. Can you can you give us your social media links? Tell everyone how they can access all your stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. What a fun chat we've had. Yeah. So get health, hlth.com is where we regularly put out blog content. You've helped do that before, yeah. Temple. Thank you. And people can learn more about the shake. But also my social media channels are, are pretty active. I try to do a couple posts a week, which is for me pretty active. I have a very hard time doing more than that. Yeah. And typically it's just little tidbits of in insight into human metabolism. Yeah. Um, and people can find me on all the major ones, Instagram, um, Twitter, X, um, you know, Facebook, and they can find me at, you, you can find me at Ben Bickman, B-I-K-M-A-N, no C in Bickman, Ben Bickman, PhD. Yeah. And I, guys, y'all have to go follow Dr. Bickman. I love that you break down science into, into understandable things and you make it simple for people to understand just like you did in the book. So Go follow Dr. Bickman and thank you again for, like I said earlier, just being so gracious with your time. My pleasure. This was great. Thank you, Temple. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. As just a reminder, you can find all of the information we chatted about in the show notes. So go there now. And if you love this episode, please consider subscribing to my channel, liking, sharing, do whatever you can to get the word out. I appreciate you being here. It means the world.